Man, that's so obnoxious. Did you do a lab record? Okay, it, it didn't specify like um, on computer or cloud. It just said mm -hmm. lab record. Um, yeah, did I, maybe it just does it based on um, whoever started it. So I might just do wherever your default. Okay. Normally it just saves to my to my hard drive when I do. Yeah. So, okay. Perfect. All right. Good. Enjoy. It's like we're good to go. I guess we're good to go. All right. So welcome to what I believe is like the fourth or fifth lecture in this series so far. Um, this one will cover U.S. empire and capitalism. This is just mostly an overview of American interventions and how it would relate to the global economy. So you have three major objectives or like sort of goals that are set for this particular presentation. Um, first is that we're gonna have an overview of the historical and geopolitical context that provides foundation for the United States global presence today. Develop an understanding of how the establishment and protection of commercial interests provides a justification for American military initiatives and investigate the concepts of globalization, empire, um, new imperialism to develop a critical context of understanding American military presence today. So the U.S. has approximately 800 military bases in more than 70 countries and territories across the world and 20 years since 9-11. Contrary to what we might believe, the war on terror is as active as ever with counterterrorism operations in 40% of the world's nations, which is what this little graph, not graph, this little um, map or image from 2017, 2018 is outlining is all the different sort of points where the United States ever is do it has a military base or a lily pad, um, where the United States is engaging in military exercises, training assistance, actual combat, or things like drone strikes. So, and this geopolitical arrangement is a result of over a hundred years of interventions, conflicts, and wars that have worked to establish the United States as a global superpower. It's important to keep in mind while that the influence of and reach of the force of the United States is vast and distinct from the European empires that preceded American hegemony, right? So it's not the same, like imperialism in the way that we think of imperialism today is not necessarily comparable to what was happening in the 18th, 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, it can, if you want to think of it contextually, uh, historically, it is the British Empire that was arguably the last great empire, and the peak of its influence culminating in the 19th century with the start of the Industrial Revolution around the 1830s. Like the Industrial Revolution gave England a really unique advantage to colonize the world to the extent that it did, because as it realized that it could ump up its industry, it required a need for more raw goods and raw materials, and as a result, uh, it encouraged it to sort of spread its territorial boundaries and its claims to land beyond just the North American continent. So question that we want to first start to answer is where does the United States fit within the rise and fall of great empires and how has it attempted to participate in a global imperial project? The best place to start is at the turn of the 19th century. Throughout the 1800s, the United States expanded dramatically across the North American continent. And so as you can see, there's a little timeline here that sort of outlines this particular process of expansion. Um, if you've taken a, hopefully a history class or at very least an AP US history class, these sort of like events should be um, partially familiar to you in some capacity. So it starts through the Louisiana Purchase, transitions to the acquisition of Florida, which starts in 1810. That process completes itself around 1827. Um, then soon after, the United States really intensifies its Indian and removal and displacement efforts, Indian meaning indigenous American um, tribes and communities and nations that 
preceded the arrival of European settlers. So like this process is obviously happening since like the encounter between Europe and the New World or North America slash Turtle Island, but it is at the turn of the 19th century in which these, excuse me, yeah, the turn of the 19th century in which these efforts intensify, coming with things like, you know, land, you know, the establishment of various reservations, um, Trail of Tears, all that, who do you have? 15 years later, there's the Texas annexation. So this is like when Texas formally tries to separate from uh, Mexico. And this is also what initiates or creates the conditions for the Mexican-American War that lasts until 1848 with uh, the Mexican secession, which is how the United States gains the large, the south, most of the Southwest and California. Um, in between Texas annexation and Mexican secession, there's uh, the establishment of Oregon County, Oregon, Oregon County, Oregon country, um, which is basically the north and western portion of what is now the United States. So that'd be Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and my geography is a little bit murky past what's on the other side of Idaho. So you're just gonna have to <laughs> hold my just hold it there. Um, and another thing that sort of actually interesting about this particular process of expansion, especially in the context of the United States, is from 1803 to 1848, a lot of this country is still splitly owned between the Spanish, the French, and the English. So you have the Spanish and the South towards Spain. Um, then you have the Spanish towards the Southwest before Mexico separates or um, claims sovereignty away from Spain, becomes its own independent country. So a lot of those territories that Spain acquired didn't become Mexican territories, right? And then on the Oregon country, which used to be called Oregon territory, there were joint claims for uh, land ownership and competition between the French, the English and American settlers. And a way in which these various powers would work to establish claims on the land was through in, in initiating certain economic relations in those areas. So especially for like the Louisiana Purchase, the establishment of Oregon country, a uh, common tactic that English and European settlers would use outside of this exploration being like, oh, I'm here, I've seen it, I found it, clearly because no other European people were here, it now belongs to us. Um, they would also develop various trades as a, to sort of interact with, with local indigenous populations and communities, as well as other competing settlers. And the most common um, trade that they used in order to justify their presence was the purchase and sale of fur. So fur trading was a big uh, aspect of establishing claims to land and ownership. So while this is like a really intense period of expedition, growth, and expansion that continued throughout the 1850s and 60s, um, the Civil War is what really puts a pause on the rapid expansion and management of these territories. It makes sense. You know, countries are now split in half, the South is succeeding from the Union. The sort of idea of this America that's growing has to be put aside for this ability to, you know, come together and resolve that internal conflict as a result. So I'm gonna obviously cover the civil war because that's a whole kit and caboodle in itself. So after the civil war, we have this lovely gentleman that's to the right, you know, who is the secretary of state, William H. Seward, who argued that as a prosperous nation, America should push to become a global power. So in 1867, Seward successfully arranges for the purchase of Alaska from Russia, but it's prevented by Congress from purchasing Greenland and Iceland, as well as annexing several territories in the Caribbean due to a growing anti-imperialist expansionist sentiment, right? And this is, this is arguably not very new in the United States. Right, if you want to think about, has anyone here know what the Monroe Doctrine is? Off chance? Yeah, yeah, I believe I'm familiar with it from um, like US history classes. Yeah, uh, Natalie, are you familiar 
is when um, yeah it's like uh like other countries can't uh, like attack like cuba or like we can't attack other countries it's like an agreement yeah so it was an agreement it wasn't like a formal like law that was put into place it was a sort of moment in james mattis james i almost said james madison when i meant to say james monroe um and president monroe's speech his state of the union and i want to say 1820 which basically was like look we will not intermingle with any so basically because the, the new, new world and the old world were sort of establishing themselves right as sort of separate areas and arenas because like this is like a few years after america formally becomes a its own state and so basically like look if there are independent like if there are like movements for independence that happen in this area like we will support them but we're not going to go out of our way to necessarily like antagonize or encourage pre-existing European colonies to sort of just, you know, revolt against their motherlands, right? Like if the, but if that process happens organically, we will support that in whatever way possible. So it's just sort of like a hands off, we won't bother you, Europe, in your maintenance of colonies, which means in turn that you shouldn't bother any of the sort of new democratic republics that could spring over the, you know, course of history. So is that like good for y'all in terms of like a brief recap? Yeah. All right, cool. So, and another thing to sort of put these things into perspective is like at this point, like in, in America's history, the country is about 84 years old, which is still like very new in comparison to like the long standing empires of England, France, Spain, um, and the general European powers. So, there's a segment of the population that's like, we need to really work on building a stable democracy. Like we don't wanna be like those colonial European powers that we fought to gain our independence from in the first place. And so that's like one of the sort of perspectives or sentiments that animates this anti-imperialist expansionist sentiment that's consistent in some ways with the Monroe Doctrine. At least a interpretation of the Monroe Doctrine. Um, while there's another segment of the population that is just straight up racist and has anxieties about like integration and management of those communities, those populations that they deem inferior um, by expanding who what, or what would constitute the American nation. And just like to backtrack very quickly about the Monroe Doctrine. So like, I know how I just said, like there was one sort of more like, oh, we should, you know, stay passive hands on. But later on, and as we see throughout the course of this sort of trajectory, um, more and more expansionist presidents start to sort of invert the Monroe Doctrine in a way that allows them to support ongoing claims for independence within the sort of like a North American region, right? And that's like one of those moments in which like later on America starts to establish itself as at least not a, even if not a global presence, a very strong regional presence that should be able to direct, assist, and um, guide these these relative like new, these colonies and these new nations that are starting to pop up. So, as it says on the slide, throughout the latter half of the 19th century, and with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in the United States, power becomes more consolidated into the federal government, and it made it easier for expansionist presidents to expand the country's influence throughout the Western Hemisphere and the New World. Um, and this ultimately culminates in the Spanish-American War um, in 1898. So the Spanish-American War is interesting in that prior to that war, the US ends up backing revolts in Cuba and in the Philippines advocating that advocate for their own independence and separation for um, from the Spanish Empire. Another interesting thing about this war is that it was really short. It was only 10 weeks later with the US end up acquiring Puerto Rico, Guam, the Philippines, as well as Spain relinquishing sovereignty over Cuba. And this war would ultimately be like one of the final nails in the coffin for the Spanish Empire because it was already very weak from the conflicts that were happening in Europe, Napoleon's invasion of Spain, and so on, while the United States still had a very, you know, sophisticated and built up military infrastructure from just participating in the Civil War, right? And the another big aspect of the Spanish-American War was that it was a weird, weirdly unifying moment for a country that was just in the middle of a deep conflict. Then, 
after the Spanish American War, the United States would also annex Hawaii in 1898, which was a conclusion of a coup that started at the removal of Queen Lulu Kani in 1893. And this conspiracy was between US ambassador John L. Stevens and a cabal of American citizens, foreign nationals, mostly British and Hawaiian subjects of American descent because Hawaii was like a, Hawaii was a mixed monarchy republic at the time. Um, and this cabal of collaborators was called the Committee of Safety. And what they ended up doing was to use the United States Marine Corps to assist in the collapse of the Hawaiian monarchy in the name of protecting American property or citizens, because a lot of what these people would do in their collaboration with Ambassador Stevens would be like, oh, the Queen of Hawaii is actually infringing on our ability to you know, maintain our American properties, our businesses, and our communities. And so we need you to protect those things, which became one of those more flexible interpretations of the Monroe Doctrine that was used at the time to justify the end of what was effectively a 19th century intervention in Hawaii. Before we transition to the next part of our discussion, which will be focusing a lot on the 20th century, right? I just want to take a second to look at this political cartoon. Um, let me see if I can open another window because it's kind of difficult to see the caption at the bottom, but I just sort of want you to really look at this cartoon and just take a second to think about what is it trying to say about the expansion and growth in the United States between, especially the expansion that happens throughout the course of the 1800s. Are you like, you want us to answer, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I was just making sure that it wasn't yeah. like rhetorical. No, no, this is a this is a little bit of interactive portion. So like this is an activity that I just would have wanted us to like riff off of for a second. Yeah, like as like America like expanded and got bigger, like more people were either involved or like wanted to be involved either like for the purpose of being an ally or like at least to be in the mix somewhat kind of. <laughs> Okay, that's definitely a interpretation, you know. Uh, Lucas, what about you? What do you get from this particular political cartoon? Uh, yeah, so, um, so like I see that it's like, uh, just kind of showing how the United States has gotten like, you know, larger over time as it acquired more territory, uh, either to like sail or like act like expansionism like violently and everything like uh, i see in like 1899 it has cuba and the philippines and, and puerto rico uh you know which were obviously like acquired in separate ways or like the influence was acquired in separate ways compared to like the louisiana purchase or something like that so and i mean they almost look like bloated and everything and i see mm -hmm. that it says that uh now all the nations are anxious to be on friendly terms with Uncle Sam. It kind of like is foreboding in like it kind of suggests that the United States didn't really get it in a, uh, you know, very great way. Yeah, anyway. so that's that's a definitely another interpretation, right? Because if you notice the growth in between 1861 and 1899, like the figure of Uncle Sam becomes bloated and what is he, and if you want to look at, especially the comparison between 1899 and 80 years earlier in 1819, what, what is different in between the, the weapons or the things that are being held by each representation of Uncle Sam? Oh, okay. So yeah, like he goes from holding just like a small firearm uh, and like another arm, another firearm on his back to having like a warship. Yeah, it's a battleship, right? And if you also notice what's in that Uncle Sam's mouth. The cigar? Yeah, cigar. And so that, that cigar is also like a nod to the increasing industrialization that was happening in the United States. 
But I think both of y'all's interpretations are definitely solid about this political cartoon. And even though this title, this title is the lesson for anti-expansionists, I would think that that's sort of like a tongue in cheek title, especially because if you like notice the growth becomes like really excessive, right? The, the shirt or button down, I forget what this is, like the formal name of this particular fashion piece is. But if you notice the starts to become, the buttons start to get real stressed, the belt is gone, the belly is rounder, right? So like there's something about this excess, right? That is slightly threatening, but also in some way is requiring the cooperation of all of these other nations that are trying to be on friendly terms with Uncle Sam. And you notice how the language he uses in this particular cartoon is that are anxious, right? It's not like a question of like, this is a like peaceful or benign sort of, or like a natural sort of conclusion, but like they don't wanna be the victims or the, you know, on the receiving end of this growing force that has managed to, you know, expand so rapidly over the course of 30 to 40 years. And if you wanna be super realistic over the course of a hundred years. So the increasing pace of expansion coupled with the rise of the industrial revolution in the United States also meant a growth in commercial interests that the United States had to protect within the region and results in a couple of military interventions that were mentioning um, the Panama Canal Zone, which is what this particular cartoon is from. The United States really in some aspects kind of bullied Panama into getting the America have possession, ownership and management of that canal, which is very important considering that is a major trade route and channel throughout the region, uh, as well as the occupation of the Dominican Republic that happened in 1916. So like the United States is becoming more bold and more active in its uses of the Maroon Doctrine, its understanding of its ability to shape international relations or geopolitical relations within its own regional zone. This changes after World War I as American participation is a decisive factor in ending the war and President Woodrow Wilson, who um, just for all intents and purposes was a real big fan of the film Birth of a Nation, um, which is definitely really suspect despite being like a advocately progressive politician and governor of New Jersey, just to point that out, was instrumental for advocating for the League of Nations as well. So like the League of Nations was a sort of prototype for the United Nations that will be developed after World War II, which is going to be, a, this is where our sort of, I think the fun part of our discussion becomes or happens after that. So, the, but the ultimately what happens is despite the United States increasing its role in international affairs, there's still a strong isolationist sentiment because you know, World War I was for known as the Great War. It was like, this is the biggest war the world has ever seen. And for a lot of people, it just justified the need for America to stay in its own hemisphere, to stay in its own region and to continue focus on working and improving the sort of democratic experiment that was started in 1783. So in addition to isolationism, the Great Depression really forces America to withdraw from the international arena. Like everyone's economy is tanked, absolutely wrecked. So there's not really any incentive to participate in this sort of world building process if like we're all trying to struggle. And I mean like we all, like literally every major nation that had like a global, any partially globalized economy was hit hard by the Great Depression. So. And another thing to consider is after World War II, um, out of all the participants, the United States was the only major power not to suffer economically, right? As well as the only nation to possess nuclear weapons. The reason why it wasn't able to suffer economically because it was able to really ramp up its industry and uh, ability to produce goods, right? especially after it was able to mobilize a lot of like the domestic workforce once they sent all the men off to war. That's when you know women started to work in factories. You get Rosie Deriveter, and there was a really huge economic surplus that was produced as a result of the United States participation in the war because they were far enough away that they could never really be hit directly through like you know German attacks, which is why the closest um, 
attack that happened to the United States was Pearl Harbor by the Japanese in addition to the assaults that were placed in the Philippines and Guam. So like the American mainland was never really threatened by the, the, the possibility of direct war. Um, in addition to having those new damn found advantages, the United States with the goal of preventing new conflict or preventing a large scale war or a large scale conflict became extremely involved in global affairs as a result. And this led to the creation of the United Nations. And y'all see, cause it's like full screen. So I'm not sure if the aspect is on me or if it's just the way that this slide is formatted. Uh, I think I can possibly, oh, well, I guess it stops at as well as a foreign. Oh, okay. Actually, it all came through for me now. All right, I'm, just making, I'm just making sure you know, it's definitely the aspect ratio for my screen data. Cause it's like, it, I can only see the section that says in addition. And then it says like economy. I can't see the word, all the word economy, but we're good. All right. So in addition to the United Nations, a lot of the infrastructure that makes up the global economy was developed at the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944. Bretton Woods is a place in New Hampshire. It was a nice hotel that all of these delegates came to um, in order to agree upon a series of rules to govern the post-World War II and a national monetary system and led to the creation of the International Monetary Fund, IMF, the International Bank for the Reconstruction and Development, uh, which eventually became, I think also became the World Bank. The IMF was intended to maintain a system of fixed exchange rates centered on the US dollar and gold, as well as create the conditions for global trade by providing short-term financial assistance to countries experiencing temporary deficits in their spending. So the idea of deficit spending was really popular, the ability for you know, governments to spend massive amounts of money in order to maintain the general welfare of the economy and its population. And then the IBRD was responsible for providing financial assistance for the reconstruction of war ravaged nations and the economic development of less developed countries, which is a thing that we'll talk about in a bit. These two organizations, along with an economic system that allowed for open markets, convertible currency and a foreign exchange. So that's the sort of end result of this conference is creating these two systems. I think the other thing that's important about things like the foreign exchange and the ability to have convertible currencies is that it allowed for capital to become flexible and sort of become more permeable between different nations. Because um, for a long time, it was very difficult. So like if you had a US, US dollars to sort of be able to use that in a way that was comparable to the British sterling that was comparable to yen, peso, et cetera. Um, but this also this conference gave a unique opportunity for the United States to really set the terms of those international relations. And so far as they use these particular forms to sort of use the dollar as a metric of how we would consider economic growth. So if you're able to also make your currency tied to this standard, tied to the system, right? It gives you the ability to sort of have a little bit more influence and control as to how and put different types of pressures on countries economically as a result of being able to do so. So these central planning systems were in part developed by and advocated by the economist Harry Dexter White, um, who weirdly enough, it got convicted for espionage by being a spy for the Soviet Union. Um, despite being the special assistant to the United States Secretary of the Treasury, and John Maynard Keynes. I actually spent a very long time trying to make sure not to say Keynes, but it's Keynes. Um, he is also a, an especially important figure because his theory of economics or Keynesianism um, was served as a justification for economic interventions and inspired a lot of the economic policies that worked to combat the Great Depression. And well, that really means is like economic interventions that the state should have the ability to intervene in the market process 
to correct market failures and to promote the general welfare of the people. So like, if you're like thinking about this in the context of the Great Depression, that makes a lot of sense in which like, you know, lazy fake capitalism was a thing. We kind of let it run wild, run its course. And then the stock market crashed and literally people around the globe had their entire lives like ruined and like financial opportunities destroyed. Um, we don't want to have that happen again. So while we know capitalism is in some ways good for you know peace, prosperity, and making sure people have goods and services, we should be able to sort of steer that hand of the American of the invisible market in the way that provides the general the most about a possible good for the most amount of people. So and the other thing that's important to think about Keynesianism and this idea of economic interventions is that they understood the national economy as like a kind of object of management, like the same way that we can manage fields, that we can manage uh, children, that we can manage education. The economy is another thing that we can quantify and understand through mathematics. And if we can understand it that way, we can effectively be able to control, manage, and produce the best possible outcome. Um, that really did become a very dominant perspective for, you know, from the 1940s up into the 70s. Um, but there were definitely people who were against or had reservations about Keynesian economics or Keynesian economics. Um, and those people are primarily folks that either preferred very classical liberalism or what we now call neoliberals who were very wary of things like uh, central planning, right, and the ability for states to influence markets because they saw that they viewed it as a teetering towards socialism and communism, which was not a thing that people were really a fan of. Oh, it went back to the other slide. So yeah, these are two people I'm talking about. Sorry about that. And so by creating these two institutions, the United States committed itself to becoming deeply involved in the world's problems. Um, but, you know, since this is post World War Two, there's another country that's going to take up a little bit of a problem with that. And that is the Soviet Union and what is effectively the start of the Cold War. So Cold War is just simply a period of geopolitical tension between the United States and the Soviet Union and their respective allies in the Western and Eastern Bloc. So the Western Bloc in this instance is blue. The Eastern Bloc is red, and the green are the neutral or what they titled at the time third world um, participants. So, like, especially within the 1950s up until like pretty much the end of the 20th century, the world was split into these particular these three factions. First world was over here and consisted of United States, Canada, its Western allies, throw South Africa in there too um australia and then you had the soviet union china its eastern bloc over here um which also spread into germany like literally split germany in half and then you have africa what is considered africa south america latin america southeast asia parts of india were considered the third world while you know middle east was considered neutral and so on. I can't remember what this country is up here. It's either Norway or Sweden, but whatever. One of the, the Netherlands. Not as important. So the reason why this really happened is that the United States viewed the spread of communism as a threat to the global system it was trying to build post World War One, which spread, you know, liberal democracy, free trade, capitalism, and all that jazz. It was called a Cold War because there was no direct conflict between the two sides. But each superpower supported major regional conflicts and participated in intervention campaigns, as well as the development of nuclear weapons. And this intervention campaign is going to be really important later on when we're talking about the new ways in which imperialism or new ways in which intervention functions to maintain certain geopolitical interests. Additionally, the Cold War produced a series of organizations that still are really relevant today, which is first one being the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, Treaty Organization, which is NATO. And that was created by the United States and its Western Bloc allies as part of a larger strategy of containment, which was like the dominant sort of military practice of the United States at that time in order to stop the spread of communism. It was called containment. 
Um, and the reason this happened was as immediately after the war, the USSR, the Soviet Union, annexed a lot of the countries it fought on its way to capture Berlin. And this was just viewed as a really big threat by Western countries who were already recovering from the destruction of Nazi Germany's geopolitical aspirations. So like everyone's really freaked out that like, you basically, you know, you can feel as Russia as that person that just comes into your house and just decide, you know, like, you know what, they clean up a little bit and then they're like, you know what, I'm just gonna stay here for a while. And then they're like, you know, what? I'm just gonna stay here forever. And so once they made that sort of transition, a lot of people became freaked out and then they started developing nuclear weapons and that's how things start to conflict, get more complicated and escalated as a result. Another thing that's important about the Cold War is that this period is defined by a lot of indirect competition from both sides and sh very shaky in alliances. For the United States, this meant propping up sympathetic dictators like Shah Pahlavi in Iran, supporting monarchs like the Saudi royal family in Saudi Arabia, to supplying weapons with arms and money in Afghanistan, the Mujahideen, which just eventually became the foundation for Al Qaeda, and Nicaragua with the Sandinistas. The United States regularly backed anti-communist, socially conservative nationalist leaders in their attempt to contain communism, which is like a very weird tension and considering like, oh, we're trying to spread democracy. Or, oh, we're trying to spread freedom for all, but you were willing to get in bed with these states that ideologically were opposed to most of those things, but were definitely your sort of bedrocks against the spread of communism, which I guess they viewed as a greater threat or evil. Another conversation that's important here is the fall of colonial empires that happened during the mid 20th century. So basically since like the start of the 40s, roughly about 1944, up until the end of the 1960s going into the 70s, all of the former colonies that were like occupied by Europe started to gradually declare their independence for multiple reasons. One, they were just tired of the sort of expropriation of labor and resources that happened on their lands, the mistreatment of their communities and just sort of the sort of subhuman status that were given to those people. And it also was a result of World War II that Europe just didn't have the capacity to sort of manage, maintain that global war machine that is necessarily to continually maintain colon colonies very far from the homeland. So. As a result of this world that has now become bipolar, you have the United States on one hand, you have the USSR on the other hand, they all see these different sort of independence movements, these sort of mom these moments of decolonization either as an advantage to the spread of their ideological and geopolitical interests, or they view it as a very big threat. So like if you're in the United States, you're gonna be really freaked out if like all of these countries in Africa, which have very rich natural resources um, and opportunities for economic growth, at least on your end, start to affiliate with the Soviet Union and deny your ability to sort of actually operate there and establish those particular globalized markets. Um, so a big part of the Cold War was managing the sort of after effect or consequences of decolonialization and sort of occupying that power vacuum that happens as a result of it. So in obviously as a result, the United States intervened in hundreds of conflicts over the course of the Cold War, resulting in a complete set of alliances, not complete, a complicated set of alliances, tensions, and relationships across the globe. And finally, the Cold War ends with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, and while the United States did reduce some of its military spending, the infrastructure and alliances from that war uh, remain. And there was definitely a popular quote by Bill Clinton as he was like, you know, going out of office, uh, which was which sort of animates this post Cold War um perspective of the united states as a peacemaker because he said in his speech uh, his state of the union speech that we should be and we must be peacemakers right so the role of the united states after the collapse of the soviet union um was to sort of maintain that infrastructure that happened as a result Right, and this sort of happens, and because like the un, there was like a really huge uncertainty about the collapse of the Soviet Union, what was going to happen to those Eastern Bloc countries, right? 
Um, so as a result, NATO was also expanded as a way of keeping Eastern European nations united after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, which is why they entered, there were several interventions, or a couple interventions in the places like the Bosnian War and the, the Kosovo War, which are part of a larger thing called the Yugoslav Wars. If you wanna look up how the dissolution of Yugoslavia after the Soviet Union kind of produced uh, chaos for that region. So now we're gonna move on to globalization. Globalization is also a really important part of this sort of understanding of US empire and like way imperialism functions today um, because globalization is the process of interaction, integration among people, companies and governments worldwide. Globalization consists of the free rapid movements and exchanges of human beings, goods, services, capital, technologies all over the planet. Globalization assumes that the world operates under various but similar economic and cultural regimes, which is like one of the common jokes about globalization is no matter what corner of the world that you might find yourself in, you know that you'll be able to find at least a 7-Eleven or a McDonald's. Um, but like systematically and structurally, it means that we have integrated trade systems, free exchange of currency and capital, good and services and people um, are traveling more. As a result, borders become more permeable and this ability to invest capital anywhere in the world allows from the global economy to become speculative versus like, oh, do you produce this good? Does this good good? Can we exchange this good for use value? Something that has exchange value, something that we can use to better ourselves, our communities and so on versus like, how can I generate more money off of my money? And how can I spread that money globally so that I have different investments in different parts of the world that allow me to sort of dictate and have you know, flexibility with my assets and my ability to sort of make decisions about what happens. So a thing that a lot of scholars in the political left would argue is that the, our current form of globalization is a neoliberal one because it really is trying to celebrate that sort of fluid, fluid, uh, fluidity and flexibility of capital and its ability to sort of, you know, regulate bodies, goods, services, and people. All right, so now transition to sort of uh, hopefully a brief discussion about neoliberalism. Like this in itself could be a whole separate lecture, but I think it's important to sort of talk about it briefly in our conversations about interventionism and how the United States operates globally. Uh, there are three particular ways in which we can talk about neoliberalism. It's generally they have three more or less incompatible definitions that are more often and not intentional with each other. So the first one is as a period, which is an area or a period of time roughly in the early 1970s to the present that starts with the end of the Bretton Woods system and the rise of the Washington Consensus. This is an era in which we are told and encouraged to act as entrepreneurs of our self-capital and that there's an innately economic impulse of man. And this impulse overcomes any level of national sovereignty and national policy ends up being determined by this thing that we call the global economy. The next definition of uh, neoliberalism is as a rationality or as a logic that reduces human experience and sense of self or what is known as subjectivity as containers of value that we can speculate on and attempt to maximize the value through various forms of self-management and organization of everyday life. And there's a really, really good book by Wendy Brown called Undoing the Demos, Neoliberalism Stealth Revolution, that has a really, I think, succinct and clear explanation of what neoliberalism is as a rationality. The third definition of neoliberalism that gets thrown around is as an intellectual movement or an ideology that begins in 1938 with a gathering of intellectuals in Paris at the Walter Lippmann Colloquium, where an ideological camp uh, argued that free trade and laissez-faire capitalism will lead to more equitable society by making essential policy, almost essential politics, essential products available to all. This intellectual movement was concerned with how to protect capitalism against the threats of democracy versus the more Keynesian approach, which was like, oh, we should figure out ways in which we can manage um, 
capitalism as a result. So ultimately, neoliberalism should be seen as an evolving ideology that seeks to develop an understanding of the logic of capital at a global level in competition with other economic and social forms of organization. And this understanding of capitalism can also sort of refer back as a return to the sort of classical liberalism and the work of Adam Smith, as well as a group of economists at the University of Chicago called the Chicago School, led by this man, Milton Freeman. Members of this economic movement, the Chicago School, played a major role in establishing and managing the economies of Central and South American nations, using a, those countries as a laboratory for a lot of their economic ideas. There's a bunch of writing on how the Chicago School influenced a lot of these sort of decisions and for policy decisions and economic decisions the United States made throughout the 60s and 70s that we will not cover here for the sake of time. Um, but a person that definitely you should look into if you want to develop your understanding of um, neoliberalism is Quinn Slobodain, who wrote this book called Globalist, which talks a lot about how the sort of current condition of the global economy and what its relationship to neoliberalism is. And oops, neoliberalism connects itself back to globalization because they both share this understanding of that goods should be able to move freely and capital should be also be able to move as freely as possible because that will create jobs, that will create markets, that will create institutions that allow for the social welfare of all, but ultimately really ends up providing social welfare for the people that can make hundreds of billions of dollars a year, the Bezos is, the, you know, I guess like that's everyone's favorite billionaire punching bag, Jeff Bezos and Amazon. So, and they have a very deep globalized presence throughout um, the world or, you know, all right. So another thing we're gonna talk about briefly is this book by Michael Hunt and Antonio Negri called Empire, right? This book is a really old, came out in 2000, but it's very fundamental to a lot of conversations that people have about globalization and like the sort of financial impact of those various institutions. This book works to describe a new form of global political order that they both call empire that comes as a result of those transformations and in international relations that happened in the early 90s with the fall of the Eastern Bloc, the more intense involvement of the US and NATO in those particular global affairs and a gradual expansion of things like the, IM, the IMF and the World Bank, which culminates in the creation of the WTO or the World Trade Organization at the end of the 90s. Hart and Negri use this concept of empire to describe the different centers of power that work to support the liberal democratic institutions and financial arrangements that make up the contemporary global political design. They argue that this organization, despite the fluctuations we may see in the New York Stock Exchange or the various military interventions, is not chaotic but part of a particular world order. They also argue that nation states are important, but they argue that those their power is connected to the power of supranational organizations, such as the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, NATO, and the United Nations. These are particularly important because a lot of those organizations are not, you know, democratic. Like they aren't, the people that run the WTO, the people that run NATO, World Bank, are not elected positions, but they are selected to represent the interests of particular nations and particular groups of people. And I'm, this picture over here, I think is a very um, fun interpretation of empire is actually is a opening, I think of a counter terrorist center or like, you know, it's like, it's like an anti uh, anti extremist center that's in Riyadh or that's in Saudi Arabia. I used to, I really did spend a lot of time trying to make sure I correctly pronounced the capital of Saudi Arabia and just didn't happen at the time. All right. You know, even us debate coaches, we all have our moments. All right, so this is what I thought would happen. So maybe, if... okay. So we gotta fix that and explains a lot. There's a lot going on in the background. So I'm trying to really figure out why that's happening. So 
pedal latch down on the trunk. But this could be a classic case. The CIA has been calling this pedal latch. The CIA itself knows a thing or two about how to influence foreign elections. During the Cold War, the United States deemed it necessary to stop the spread of communism around the world. Sometimes that involved sponsoring a military coup to overthrow a democratically elected leader with communist eyes. That's the CIA. Okay, were people able to hear that video that was going on in the background? Yeah, I was able to hear it. Okay, because it's not showing it moving on my screen, so I'm not really sure if that's like a Zoom thing or a Google uh, Google thing. So instead of just going through that, that video is, maybe if I just, I'm going to share it on a different tab and see if that works, because that might be a more efficient way to do this. Okay, can you see the screen now? Does it have this picture of Lud yes, Ludacris saying he can't cook? Yes. All right, yeah. so that's, we'll just do it this way because I think it's just easier in terms of how Zoom does things um, versus how Google does things. So I'm mute the sound until after the ad it happens. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, I have to, for some reason, pull up my PowerPoint again. But we're almost done. We're actually in the last couple of slides. All right. So the thing that that reason that I played that video is just to sort of give you an insight as to like the there are like literally hundreds of instances of military interventions ever with actual full forces or you know small organizations like the like the CIA and that's because the nature of how we can understand these interventions changes as like the way in which how we understand global international relations changes. Um, there are a few terms used by military planners and officials to uh, describe this new way of approaching warfare, which is low intensity conflict, small wars, counterinsurgency, and military operations other than war. Um, military operations other than war is a particularly interesting aspect as it can describe a wide range of actions ranging from subversive economic and diplomatic means, as well as the use of military force at various degrees to shape governance and the geopolitical orientation of a particular state. And that, so it's, that's more consistent with the country that's using these military operations up in the war. So the United States isn't the only one to use these options. Um, Russia has definitely used them. China has definitely used them to expand their sphere of influence. But what's important is that these four terms sort of set the framework of what is called a hybrid war, as these interventions do not depend on the full deployment of conventional forces in order to change the policy of another government, which is why, like, you know, mentioning the CIA is important and um, the U.S. Special Forces is important because the U.S. Special Forces runs directly through the Pentagon to the White House, right, versus the military, which runs primarily through the entire government, you cannot authorize certain, well, that's changed because there are different sorts of authorizations for different degrees of conflict. But the point being is that like, if the United States wanted to formally declare a war, it would have to go through Congress and they would have to approve that process and so on. The other thing that I wanna do before, and this is like the closing note before we answer a couple of questions and go off for the day, um, while the United States and Russia and China have all participated in these tactics of hybrid wars to expand their geopolitical influence, right? The scholar Vijay Prashad isolates uh, the couple of ideological pieces that provide a context for this idea of hybrid war and Cold War policies of the United States. First one is in 1962 with the Kennedy administration. Um, they released a document on foreign internal defense, which stated it is important for the United States to remain in the background and not expose the US to the charges of interventionism and colonialism. And like, this is important for Prashad because he argues that this, um, at the time, the Kennedy Ministry administration is actually acknowledging that its policy is practically intervention and colonialism, but they wanna make sure that they control like, the sort of marketing on the pitch in that regard so that it's not understood as such so they cannot you know be accountable to those charges or be accountable to the consequences that come with be naming as an colonial or an imperial power another thing that's important that also frames the way in which the united states is able to engage in these acts of intervention and colonialism that don't look like intervention and colonialism is that it is able to use this notion of implicit faith, i.e. that the U.S. doesn't do things for nefarious motives, but it's for the good of others, for democracy, for humanitarian intervention, free globalized markets, etc. i.e. and that allows for people to think things like the United States never commits war crimes and that it only bonds places for humanitarian or socially liberal causes. It also allows them to also displace acts of aggression, right, and always assume that the enemy and the bad actor is always somebody or something else. You can definitely see this in the context of the Cold War, right? It's like, oh, we can't do, especially in the context of the Cold War, where there was also the civil rights movement happening alongside their attempts to contain and spread communism, right? So it's like, we're obviously the beacon of democracy, yet we also have gross injustices here and abroad in our attempts to sort of contain the spread of communism. The, and the final two things that we'll do before we close out and take questions is that there are also two other concepts that are really 
important to the formulation of these hybrid wars and the ability for states to exert geopolitical influence. The first one is primacy, right? And primacy just means the ability to establish preponderant power um, and the way in which the United States is able to influence global relations. So like, it's not that the United States is the sole king of the world that it makes decisions, but like its influence really heavily, 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 and um, heavily influences the decisions of other countries, right? Because that's like, oh, we want to always be on the good side of the United States and so on. The other idea is the concept of stability, that we need to keep the world stable from any emergent threats, people that are trying to deviate from this world order that we try to establish, right? So whenever there's like, you know, a risk of a, you know, especially in the context of decolonialization, which was happening in the mid 20th century, is that if a bunch of these countries start separating from Europe, if Europe can't manage them and the Soviet Union comes in or they choose to manage themselves in a way that's inconsistent with the values of American liberal democracy and neoliberal economies, then it's going to create an inherently unstable world because we're going to have the same sort of tensions that we had back in the early of 20th century that led to things like World War I, World War II, which is why we need to make sure we have a globalized economy, a globalized world that is relatively on the same page, right? And in order to maintain that globalized world, there needs to be a certain notion of stability uh, in terms of markets, in terms of countries, and in terms of ideological ideals. Okay, and then just take this space to, you know, if you have any questions, ask them. If you need seconds to sort of reflect and, you, you know, before asking a question or wanting to review parts of this lecture, that's totally fine, but that's really what the last section of this presentation is for. So, uh, yeah, I had a question, if that's okay. Yes. Okay. So, um, like, with the with the topic that, like, Natalie and I have this upcoming year, which is going to be, you know, something similar to, like, uh, the United States must end, like, endless wars and, and all of that. Uh, like, how do you see some of this, like, fitting into, like, that specific topic? Because I see, like, all the, like, hedge arguments and everything uh and everything in that um but like what and really it's like i think i do see ways that it obviously fits into it like it's clear as day in certain ways but i just want to get your like opinion with your experience as to how it might fit best into a debate round to be like the most effective like argument in terms of support so the, that can you unpack that question? Because it seems like you're asking multiple things oh yeah yeah sorry i just kind of got off on a tangent yeah it's so totally like, fine um, so like with it, with like the topic that Natalie and I are going to have most likely in mind, like, how do you see these, like, uh, like the information from this lecture being like employed to the most effective degree within a debate round on that, that topic or something similar? Um, probably mostly in the context of definitely, I feel like more negatives. So that's the, the resolution seems to be like, oh, we should you know, reduce or can end certain counter operations or military commitments, right? Um, but I think the, the two things, one, the sort of idea of globalization requiring some sort of shared unity means that like, even if there are, you know, changes in these operations, there are other ways in which countries can exert geopolitical influence um, through controlling certain globalized economies. I think the concept of a hybrid war is still going to be like very important, right? Because like even, even with a hybrid war, it's not just limited to direct military conflict. It could be used for things like psychological warfare. It can be economic pressures, right? So the idea that if we just end certain operations uh, counter operations in these regions that's going to produce a less hostile, less conflict filled world is one that is a perspective that sort of ignores the ways in which A, the history of interventions that the United States has participated in in order to maintain a particular notion of world order um, is still going to be present in addition to you can have military operations other than war, you can have 
you know, low intensity conflicts that still justify and in, um, interventions and interactions in this area, the sort of global presence of the United States military bases, even if we were to downscale those things, right, would still mean that there's operations that justify various kinds of interventions um, in places that have ideological or political decisions that are contrary to what the United States might desire for its own nation. Okay, yeah, that, that's something. Because like a thing you should think about too is just like in the context of like globalization, right? We have managed to split the world into the two major quadrants, the global north and the global south, right? And like in order for the sort of ability for us to receive our cheap, you know, fast fashion, you know, high tech goods, new iPhones, so on, there's gonna have to be a certain class of people that has to work for a particular sort of like, you know, income. Like there's some people in this world that are gonna have to make 18 cents a day if we want to be able to have our like nice fancy technological goods. But in order to maintain that, cause like obviously that's not a livable standard, right? Um, there has to be some sort of military presence, some sort of force that is able to maintain those structures globally. Cause like also the thing to think about too is like, even if you like downscale some of the military operations that we have now in terms of counterterrorism, we still have you know, naval ships that go across every sea in the globe. We have planes that fly over every continent and this planet. We have, you know, bases, like I said earlier, all over the course of the, all over the world. We have drones that can strike in any particular capacity, right? So there's like all, all kinds of ways in which the United States can exert force that aren't fully dependent on what the resolution sort of wants us to talk about. Okay, uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I don't think I have any questions right now. That's fine. That's what the Discord channel is for. If you have any questions, you can never post it there, shoot a DM. And I will, if you like, want to review some of the information that's covered here, I can definitely like, send you that video, send you other resources that's, that I use to help me make this presentation as well. Awesome, that's great. Thank you. No problem. And with that, you're all good to go. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Thank you for the lecture. No problem. Anytime. Bye bye.